On this episode of the Rebel Report, basketball season has arrived and two NBA teams visit Sin City for an anticipated preseason matchup. Also, the Las Vegas Lights play their last home game and fans are already kicking at a chance to get seats for next season. Plus, we talked to Patrick Lindsay in studio about a golf tournament that has been helping Shriners children for over 30 years. All this and more next on The Rebel Report. Welcome to Studio F on the campus of UNLV. This is the second episode of The Rebel Report. I'm Jason Taktagian. And I'm Karina Trujillo. Before we dive into the show, we have to talk about how fast Vegas has become a major league sports city. There are so many things to talk about. Vegas is the place to be and UNLV is in the center of all of it. As students have the opportunity to cover teams like the Golden Knights, Las Vegas Lights, and soon enough, the Raiders, so many things to cover. Our reporters here have a busy season ahead. A few of our reporters got the chance to cover an NBA preseason game. Two of the hottest teams were in town for one night only, and they battled it out in front of an electric crowd. I was at the T-Mobile Arena to prove that Vegas can be an NBA city. Las Vegas is known as the entertainment capital of the world, but it's also becoming the mecca of sports, if it's not already. The Los Angeles Lakers and the Golden State Warriors were set for one of the most anticipated preseason matches in recent memory. The excitement of LeBron James leading the young Lakers against the best team in basketball was present all throughout the arena. Once the game tipped off, fans realized they were in for a memorable night. Highlight play. After highlight play. James, a buzzer beater, you bet! Vegas had a lot to be excited about. But one may argue that NBA fans in Vegas should be more excited about what happened before the game. The idea of an NBA team in the Sin City has been circling around the league. And Lakers duo Kyle Kuzma and Brandon Ingram had a positive look towards a potential NBA franchise. For the city, I think it would mean everything to kind of have a city, uh, NBA team. You know, with the Raiders coming here, um, got the Aces here, got the Gold Knights. Um, you know, I think it's an up and coming, you know, sports town that definitely, you know, should re really look to get an NBA team. From a Vegas standpoint, I think. I think it will be a lot of fans here. A lot of people like to like to come to Vegas. Steve Kerr, the head coach of the Golden State Warriors, recognized that Vegas already has a hot basketball fan base. Well, summer league has proven how much people love basketball out here. I mean, the, you know, summer league games are sold out sometimes, and the, the whole. Uh, Operation is so popular. Warriors all-star point guard Stephen Curry chimed in on the subject, pointing out that Las Vegas, aside from the Strip, is an unknown city. Actually, I'm still finding out most of that. No, I just I mean, there's just a diverse amount of people here. There's a different energy here when you come, uh, whether, you, whether you're from here, whether you're just visiting. Obviously, when you fly in, you do see the Strip, and that's something, the first thing that comes to mind. So we may be getting an NBA team, but one thing is for sure, a lot of people are on board. From the Rebel Report, I'm Jason Toktagian. So Jason, how was it like covering an event like this big? It was absolutely amazing. It was a wonderful opportunity to get up close and personal with all those, you know, big NBA players, literally. And uh, the final score was also 123-113 to the Lakers. And me as a Laker fan, I couldn't be more pleased. UNLV football has hit a couple bumps in the road, but after 30-point losses to New Mexico and Utah State, leading into the matchup with Air Force on October 19th. But there's still plenty of Rebel fans that make the program a big priority in their lives. Naomi Brown went out to recently to get a closer look at the fans from the stands and the game from the field. Attending a Rebel football game, whether it's away or here at home, fans show up and go above and beyond to support the Rebels. 
Since the start of the season on September 1st, the Rebels have shown that they have used their off-season time wisely. The improvements show, and those that have been supporting the Rebels from the start are excited to watch this team dominate. We go wherever UNLV goes, <laughs> so we'll be in Hawaii this year too. Rebels! Rebels. Rebels! We want the Rebels! <laughs> the Rebels were in Los Angeles to play against USC, the 15th ranked team in the nation. And although they didn't come out with the win, Rebel fans were not about to miss the game as they traveled many miles to witness it themselves. Our son played for UNLV and he's number 13 and we traveled all the way from Delaware. We wanted to see uh, the Rebels play and our favorite player, number 88, Cody Scherf. <laughs> yeah, same here. We wanted to see the Coliseum too. I've never been here. Go, Go Rebels! Rebels! <laughs> As for home games, they are on another level. The experience is one you don't want to miss. And don't be startled as fireworks go off all throughout the game. If you are sitting front row, there are many opportunities to interact with Hey Reb. There are also special performances by the Rebel Girls and the UNLV Band. Recently, the Rebels have had two successful home games, beating UTEP and Prairie View A&M. Coach Sanchez explains that the guys still have a long way to go. You know, every one of those guys has got to sit there and look at themselves and ask themselves, you know, how bad they want this. And we got to figure out who wants to be here and who wants to roll. And at the end of every game, all that there is left is confetti. And somebody's going to have to clean that up. For the Rebel Report, I'm Naomi Brown. Friday, October 19th, is UNLV's homecoming game against Air Force. If you can't make it out to that game, try to make it out to one sometime this season to see the Rebels navigate their way through the Mountain West Conference. Cashman Field was filled with soccer fans as the season came to an end. Lydia Vasquez takes a look at how the fans of Las Vegas Lights celebrate the final home game. It's a special night tonight at Cashman Field. The fans, however, filled with mixed emotions as we wrap up the last home game of the season. Las Vegas Lights fans start the celebration early, setting up just outside of Cashman Field with food, drinks, and activities. Inside, the tailgate has bounce houses and life-size foosball for kids. There is a seat for everyone around each table as fans bond with one another while enjoying food and drinks some cooking up their own feast before heading inside. Mixed emotions, you know, we're, we're happy because we get a break, but at the same time, what are we going to do now on Saturdays? Uh, we always look forward to coming here and doing a little tailgate, you know, cook, drink, you know, just have the environment with our friends. And then um, it's just, it's a bittersweet moment. For these fans, the lights are more than just a soccer team. These tailgates and games with family and friends are creating memories that will last a lifetime. When I sing, I sing for Las Vegas. Supporters marching for the final time this year at home, waving their flags, continuing to sing and chant for Las Vegas soccer. We started a year ago, it was a blank sheet of paper. We didn't have a team name, we didn't have a player, we didn't have uniforms, we didn't have any fans. And today, look at it, we've got 7,000 fans averaging right here in downtown Las Vegas, and they come and they have a great time. They're singing, they're dancing, they're cheering, they're marching, they're waving flags, they're popping smoke, they're going ole, ole, ole. Blue and yellow smoke take over the stands, the energy of the crowd so wild, Almost everyone is on their feet, but fans are also on their feet standing in line as Cashman Field offers unlimited beer for just 10 bucks. The supporter section showed up and showed out the entire game. Light's youngest fans represent their love for this team, but also getting some love in return. The Las Vegas Lights end with a win and an overwhelming appreciation, not only from the stands at Cashman Field, but from the community that the Lights have spent their entire season being a part of. About a year ago, this was just a baseball field. What a moment for the city and for these fans as the Las Vegas Lights wrap up their final home game of their very first season. For the Rebel Report, I'm Lydia Vasquez. The Lights end its first season with the record of 18, 19, and 7, and will begin year two with head coach Eric Winalda, who was just announced on October 17th. Winalda is one of the most decorated American men's players in World Cup history. The Lights will be the only team playing at Cashman Field next season when the 51s move to the Vegas, Las Vegas ballpark in Summerlin. Many Lights fans are already prepping 
for the 2019 season by competing for free season tickets. Sydney Mercado explains how fans show off a little soccer skill. It is the final home game of the season and fan appreciation night. With the season coming to its end, Las Vegas Lights fans have the opportunity to win 2019 season passes at tonight's Crossbar Challenge. The Las Vegas Lights team has already given away 18 upcoming season passes to the winning fans of the Halftime Crossbar Challenge throughout the year. This game tradition has become one of the crowd's favorites. Crossbar Challenge was exciting, really exciting. Basically, they said if, if you kick the ball and hit the crossbar, you got free season tickets for next season. It was really awesome. Everyone's getting season tickets out here. It was, it was really exciting to see. For the final home game of the season, holders of the 2018 season tickets competed for a pass. With the high energy from the crowd, four of the five competitors took home the prize. And the lights took the win. Uh, whether we win or lose, we will always support the team. And that's the culture of soccer. Coming here, I'm like, yes, yeah, the last game. We might not win. It's okay. But the fact that we won today on the last game, it was like the cherry on top, and I'm leaving really happy. The Las Vegas Lights fans have had an intense and exciting first season, and fans are anticipating what's to come for the 2019 season. For Rubber Report, I'm Cindy Mercado. For next season, fans can look forward to team meet and greets and all-you-can-drink beer specials. Shriners Hospitals for Children are nationwide known hospitals that specialize in treatment for pediatric patients. We went out to the media day for Shriners Hospitals for Children. Our reporter, Megan Plagg, gives us the details. Media day for Shriners Hospital for Children open, and there's a lot to expect from the tournament this year. This year, Shriners Hospitals for Children open brings the FedEx Cup to the Valley as the PGA Tour returns for the 36th consecutive year. Many top golfers in the world anticipate participating in this year's competition and helping to support the mission of Shriners Hospitals for Children. Patrick Cantley explains to us what it's like to be a Shriners ambassador. It's been nice. Uh, the kids um, are so respectful and well-spoken and it's so refreshing to hang out with them and hear their stories and hear what they have to say and interacting with them and um, you know it's it's just a it's a really cool experience that I didn't realize came along with winning this tournament but I'm so glad that it has. This event showcases the current champion Patrick Cantley and three Shriners patients. We asked Patrick Lindsay, the Shriners Hospital for Children Open Tournament Director, what Shriners means to him. My son is actually a Shriner patient, so the fact that I get to operate this golf tournament that benefits such an incredible hospital network that provides care for families regardless of their ability to pay, and it helped my family and I'm touched by them, just makes me just makes me that much more appreciative to be a part of the organization. Lindsay also describes his favorite moment of the day. Um, the kids, the kids' interaction. Um, I, I love seeing the kids up here with Patrick, uh, our defending champion last year, uh, putting the, the golf ball or, yeah, the golf ball with the uh, Golden Knights, uh, the Golden Knights hockey sticks. Um, I just love taking the different community components that we have here and bringing them to the tournament and, and seeing a professional athlete interact with our patients. That's a lot of fun. This event was full of exciting activities, from the Shriners patients playing golf with champion Patrick Cantley to our very own Michaela Jackson hitting a marshmallow with a club. Patrick discussed with us what it felt like to win the Open last year. Uh, every time I come to a tournament, I expect to play well, and it's nice to come back to a place that I have played well before. And so just looking forward to walking around with good vibes after winning last year and having a nice time. I like the golf course, so it should be a good week. Vegas Golden Knights and the Raiders will have booths at the tournament this year. For Rebel Report, I'm Megan Platt. The tournament starts October 29th and ends November 4th. All UNLV staff, current students, and alumni are gifted with free tickets to this Open this year. And speaking of the tournament, Patrick Lindsay joins us in the studio to talk about what the Open has to offer. Marcos. Rebel Report, time out! Thanks guys. Today in studio we have Patrick Lindsay. He's a tournament director for
for Shriners Hospitals for Children Open. How are you doing today, I'm Patrick? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. So I did a little research into you, and I saw that you have a bachelor's in athletic training and an MBA in sports administration. Correct. So tell me how your love for sports started. Um, well, at an early age, probably like uh, a lot of people, I uh, grew up uh, playing sports, uh, played a lot of golf as well, and uh, kind of went into my undergrad degree wanting to uh, diagnose injuries and rehab injuries. And uh, as I kind of went through my career, my undergraduate at UNC Greensboro, and then post, post that, I really wanted to do some physical therapy. and. Um, Ended up kind of changing my mind of what I wanted to do once I got in the field and it ended up leading me to get my MBA in sports administration and wanted to really kind of focus on uh, putting on events and getting back into the sports world on a management level. And uh, it just so so happened and kind of a little bit of luck as well led me to golf and has now led me to Las Vegas. So before the show, we were kind of chatting a little bit mm -hmm. and you told me you had two sons. Yep. And one of those sons <clears throat> is in the open. Yep. What is that mean to you? It's pretty cool. You know, uh, uh, Wesley, uh, he's six. He was born uh, way premature, 24 weeks and two days. He was one pound, four ounces. And uh, since we've been out here in Las Vegas the last three years, Shriners has stepped in and uh, just kind of watching his development and his growth uh, and just actually performed a surgery on him a couple, couple months ago. So it's really kind of come full circle for me since I've been with this organization and the great work that they do. I mean, it's all orthopedic issues primarily, regardless of the family's ability to pay as well. So um, outside of working for Shriners and, you know, kind of, promoting their mission through our PGA Tour event. My family actually lives their mission as well with our son, Wes. And being the tournament director, what does it mean to have Jordan Spieth, who is <laughs> who's, I mean, known everywhere in the, in yeah. the, in the world, yeah. what does it mean to have him in the open? Um, we, we are just thrilled. You know, I kind of get goosebumps thinking about having him. And it's not just him. You know, we got Ricky Fowler as well. We've got like five other uh, Ryder Cup members. It's the best field that we've ever had. Um, and it's really taken about three and a half, four years worth of work to get to where we are right now. When I came on board a few years ago, um, I really had an emphasis on going out and player recruiting and getting these top players to come play in this event because I really felt that this community deserved that and they deserved to entertain are the best players in the world and we're finally getting to that point and having Jordan come play and having Jordan be exposed to our children's hospitals and that mission um, it's really setting up to a special week what do fans say when they go and they experience this open like what is their experience like uh, primarily the experience has been overwhelmingly positive you know we have had an incredible experience outside the ropes so we have a lot of different fan areas that are open to the public that people can go to um, and experience different activities we have uh, some great upgraded tickets as well into the hill that will have activations by like top golf and red rock inside um, so you know the experience outside the ropes is really great and we think this year is going to be one of the best events we've ever had and now that we have increased or enhanced the experience inside the ropes in our competition we feel like that we really have this really nice cohesive well-rounded you know kind of event that we're putting on and again we can't be more excited to, to show the community this event and you know also support the mission of the hospital how does the process of bringing these golfers into this open mm -hmm. how, how is it um it's hard you know uh, i'm probably at uh six or seven events um every year mm -hmm. you know promoting coming here promoting las vegas as a destination for them to be able to come have a good time play for a worthy cause right. and you know play in our golf tournament and try to be the champion right um it is um you know, it's just a, it's an interesting process talking to these guys because you literally have about 30 to 60 seconds right. to talk to them as they're yeah. transitioning from like the driving range to the putting green. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the opportunity you have to talk to them. And then you're following up with conversations to their agents and see what their schedule's like and if they have the, uh, the time in their schedule to come play. And it's just really the stars have aligned for us this year and it's gonna be a great event. Is there any way UNLV students and staff members can get involved or even assist the, the tournament? Yeah, so there's really, yeah. there's two main ways that you can get involved. One, you can just attend. You know, okay. We want everyone at this university 
to come to the event. And uh, this year, tickets are free for all students. So all gotcha. you have to do is come to the gate, call, come to our, our uh, main entrance, show your student ID, they'll give you a ticket and come into the event for free. And it's not just coming to the event, there are rebels that are playing in our event. So oh. Ryan Moore, for, for one, uh, who is a very accomplished golfer, will be in the event. And then we just awarded a sponsor's exemption to Shintaro Ban, a graduate just this last year, uh, an All-American UNLV golfer will be playing in the field as well. So there's definitely reasons to come out and support. And then we have volunteer opportunities as well for students to come out and be able to volunteer and kind of get that behind the scenes, um, you know, experience right. in the tournament. Right. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, yeah, for your course. time. And we'll send it over to, the, to Michaela with the panel discussion. Thanks, Marcos, for today's panel discussion. We have Sydney, Kaylin, and Lydia. We want to first talk about Patrick McCall and him rejecting his contract. First off, he was a former running rebel. He was the 2016 second pick in the draft. He's with the Golden Warriors. What do you think about him declining his contract with the Golden Warriors? Well, um, I feel that, okay, so McCall has been playing for the Warriors now for two years. And he's, he's young. He's 22 years old. And I feel like he still has a long future ahead of him in the NBA. And he's playing for one of the best um, teams in the NBA at the moment. So I personally feel that he should have renewed his contract. It's a $5 million contract for two years. Um, I feel that once he builds more of a reputation within the NBA, um, he will always have the opportunity to negotiate after his two-year contract ends and um, possibly get more play time or more money for um, his upcoming contract. What do you think about the backup uh, guard, Kalen? Um, back of guard, Patrick McCaw, I think he's a great player. I think the players around him are, is what makes him good. And I think he thrives in that situation. And I don't think he's, fr quite frankly, worth more than $5 million. On any normal team, I think he's worth the veteran's minimum. What is the veteran's minimum? Can you explain It's that? about, uh, I believe it's about a million and a half this year, a season. And I think this, that's usually what the lower tier players get or the older veterans. So I definitely think he's worth only the veterans minimum because quite frankly, I don't think he will thrive outside of a situation like Golden State. And then he missed the ring ceremony that the Golden, the, sorry, the Golden State Warriors had at, again before their game against Oklahoma City. Did you guys see the ring, how it's irre is reversible? I, I didn't see it, but it sounds cool. Yeah, and it's like there's sapphires on it. It was like a pretty cool ceremony, but he wasn't there. What did, did yeah. you mention that? Did you find out where he was? Or um, based on what I read, um, he was doing he was doing football practice stuff in a high in a high school. I believe it was his dad's high school because he his dad is a coach, um, or the high school that his that his dad coaches at. But um, I'm not too sure about that. But a lot of people are concerned about what the situation is going on with him because um, he's kind of stayed quiet. With the, he hasn't posted on social media. He hasn't been saying anything. He's pretty much hasn't had any contact with the team. So it's a concern of what his what his next move is going to be. Okay, speaking of football, Gillum, they lost against Utah State. What went wrong, Kalen? Um, right. uh, well, there were also there were a couple drops in that game. Even though Ty Lee Collins was the number one wide receiver, who, who's a freshman this season, even though he was the leading receiver for receptions, 136 yards. Um, he still had a drop in that game, and we went up against a great Utah State team. And quite frankly, even though they scored 42 straight points, we, um, we, I mean, we came out strong. We scored the first touchdown in the game, and Max Gillum helped orchestrate that by having nice passes, nice accurate passes, and nice pitches. And he had a nice run on the first play of the game. And the Air Force is coming weekend for homecoming. Well, they are a 10 point favorite. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think we'll come out strong. I think we'll beat Air Force because it's the third week with Gillum and I think he's kind of settled into a situation. He was 50% last week. He was 15 of 35 the first week. I think the players are around him and supporting cast are only getting better. Okay, great. Now, our VGK, we can't forget about them. Hey! They won. Flurry had almost got a shutout. Four to one. Fans did not get free donuts. But with this momentum of winning two straight games, How's it going to play into their next couple home games? So, you know, I definitely wouldn't consider winning two games a winning streak. It's a great sign for the Knights, but they have a lot to prove. Um, they started off with a pretty brutal schedule with five away games traveling in between. Um, but we have, they have uh, three days off, so the next game would be on Saturday. And I think with it being at home and having the, 
you know, the energy of the fans, that will help them build momentum. And then William Carlson scored his first goal of the season, just like last year in the seventh game. Do you feel like this is kind of blows off pressure for him because he only has a one-year contract with the Golden Knights? Or? Definitely, definitely. So last season he led the league with the most goals scored at home, third overall. So doing it now this, uh, during this season definitely takes a lot of weight off of his shoulders. He can play with a lot more confidence. I feel like the team will be able to play more comfortably. So with that, it's a good sign. I think it's looking good for the Golden Knights. Well, thanks guys for joining us today. Now we're sending it over back to the desk. Thanks guys. On October 18th, the UNLV women's soccer team celebrates their senior day along with playing their last home game of the season against San Diego State. Haley Jorkis gets the seniors take on their last season here at UNLV. On October 14th, the UNLV women's soccer team went head to head against San Diego State and they won 2-0 with a shutout for the fifth time this season. The Rebels also have a record of six wins, two losses and two ties, marking the third straight year under coach Shaw. Not only did they celebrate a win, but they also celebrated their seniors. Five players said their last goodbyes and looked back at their impact on the team. Senior Caitlin Kreutz registered her fifth game-winning goal of the season, ranking second in the Mountain West. I think I've learned to just like adjust because it is like a big leap being with like your group of 30 girls every day and then moving to a new group of 30 girls every day. But everyone was super welcoming, so like as tough as that was, like I had a great team to make it easier with. We do like these pre-game like rituals. Uh, we do like certain songs and stuff like that, and I'm definitely gonna miss that. We do like a double Dutch song, and we do like cheering and stuff like that, and it happens before every single game, so I'm definitely gonna miss that. This was the team's last home conference game. The ladies finish the regular season after they play against UNR on October 26th. This year, the UNLV women's soccer team is celebrating their 20th season. They also participated in Breast Cancer Awareness Month last Friday's home game against New Mexico. Caitlin and I shared the experience. That time of the year where the UNLV women's soccer team turns the fields from scarlet and gray to pink. The soccer players are not the only highlight of this game as they honor the breast cancer survivors for their strength and courage. The event kicked off with a bright atmosphere as pink ribbons, pink shirts, and even pink capes were worn by fans, players, and most importantly, the breast cancer survivors. I thought it was great that they had this event to give us recognition, but I think it's more important that we uh, create awareness and um, share the information with everyone who could be affected. People watched the full game concentrated and also enjoyed the free food provided by the soccer team. During halftime, they gave recognition to people who have survived the second leading cause of cancer death among women. I think it means a lot to a lot of people on our team and a lot of people know people that have been through a lot with breast cancer, so I think everyone kind of has something to play for tonight. The seriousness of breast cancer can sometimes be taken lightly by young people. But, according to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, older women have better chances to recover from this illness compared to younger women. It's, it's a battle for life. It's, even though, you know, I'm in remission, it's never ending. It's always constant. You always have to just be on top of things. And it's, you know, it's your health. It's what keeps you alive. These last three weeks will be crucial for the Rebels as they continue to fight for one of the six spots in the Mountain West Tournament. Despite their busy schedule, the soccer team still remembered to show their support for an important cause, the breast cancer awareness. The Kick Cancer Pink Game helps to raise awareness for the 3.3 million breast cancer survivors in America today. Plus, fans that showed up in pink got discounted tickets. That's all for this episode of the Rebel Report. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to tune in next week for our Halloween special where we wrestle with Super Benji. Goodbye, guys. Go.